<clears throat> Description. As an author, you probably started off thinking that you were pretty darn good at this. After all, description is that magical alchemy that happens when a writer looks at something, experiences something, feels something, smells something, or imagines something and manages with words to magically make someone else see it, feel it, almost hear it, smell it, and all of this just through words on a page. It is pretty magical, but once you've been doing this writing thing for a bit longer, you start to freak out because you realize that words have their limitations. And this is why writers keep learning and growing throughout their careers. It's that you never quite completely have the gist of how to do this perfectly. Sometimes you feel that you approach perfection when it comes to exactly evoking what you're feeling, seeing, imagining, but sometimes you feel like you fall miserably flat. So in this episode of the How to Be an Author podcast, I thought we would talk about the limitations of words when we completely struggle with them as authors, and especially struggling with two very complex issues, one of which is description, especially when we're talking about emotions and experiences and locations. And the second thing is the synopsis. Oh boy, so many of my writing clients as a longtime writing coach, they can throw out some wonderful chapters, but then when it's time to write a simple little synopsis, they totally break down. And let me tell you, it's not surprising. A synopsis is a high pressure piece of writing that does a lot of things. And in fact, there's no such thing as just one simple single synopsis. So we're going to be talking about these two things. Usually on the How to Be an Author podcast, I talk about three different clients, one struggling with writing craft things, one struggling with mindset, and one struggling with business. But in this episode, I'm going to be talking about two clients who are struggling with description, two completely different angles of a problem that they had with the description, and then I'm going to be talking about writing the synopsis in detail because both of these things really impact your mindset. There's a lot to unpack here. Struggling with these issues impacts your mindset and your in, your mindset also impacts them. So let's get started really fast in this completely inspiration-filled episode of the How to Be an Author podcast. You're going to find this so useful. So if you can, grab a notebook and jot down some notes. There are going to be some real gems, hacks, and how-tos in this episode. Hello, and welcome to the How to Be an Author podcast. I am writing coach Corena Akavane, and it's my passion in life to help writers like you go from idea to published and everything in between. Everything touching on craft, mindset, and the business of being a writer. I try to cut through the BS and give you some real life tips that I have learned from the clients that I've had over my time as a writing coach. And as many of you know, I have a master class that can be basically be your virtual writing coach. And I also have a workbook for the writers on a budget who want to DIY this whole author thing. So before I get started, just head over to creativeandwritingcoach.com and or online courses for writers.com. You're going to find absolutely everything you need right there. And as always, never hesitate to send me an email. I always respond to everything I receive. So if you're struggling with something and you don't know how a writing coach can help you, well, you know where to go. Now, many writers, especially novice writers, but even experienced writers, they are struggling with writing descriptions. And there are several really good reasons for this. Number one, one of the primary challenges is the fact that it's hard to find the right balance. You want to provide enough description to engage your reader's senses and imagination, but you don't want to overwhelm them because you want to leave some space for imagination to go rushing in. That's the alchemy I talk about where you've got the author's words, but you've got the reader's understanding of them. So writers are sometimes unsure about how much or how little description is appropriate for a given scene. And the two writers that I wanted to just describe in 
you know, the work that I've been doing and, and how I arrived at all these different lessons of how to do description right, I had one, Brandon, who was describing entirely too much. I mean, he would have these beautiful descriptions, very poetic, but he really wouldn't get to it when it came to the story. So that was one kind of instance where the description was thrown off. And then my other writer, Claire, she would kind of write down all of the story things happening and the reader would have felt like they were in a white room. It's that whole white room syndrome where writers sometimes forget that they need to describe some things so that we know where your characters are at any given point and what's going on. But I'm going to be giving you hacks on how to do this right, so don't you worry. Another issue that writers are having when it comes to effective descriptive writing is that they've let their observation skills flag a little bit. So many writers start off with an ability to notice details in the world around them, but then sometimes you get to this point where you get so much more concerned with transcribing those details, with describing those details, and you stop paying attention and you start freaking out about how you're writing things instead of really just sitting back and enjoying the mindfulness and the paying attention to sensory experiences. This is so valuable. And really, as a writer, you need to learn how to do things like reading, listening, and looking in a whole different way. So this is something where I've told my writers who are freaking out with description, I've been like, take yourself on a creative date. Take yourself on a creative date and go see something new, experience something new, and think about what you're seeing, what you're feeling, what you're experiencing without right now thinking of the words that you're going to use to explain that. I think that that's a really great thing to do. Another thing is that some writers, they kind of get so panicked that they start to resort to cliches or overused phrases when they're describing things. And I always want my writers not to feel too bad when I catch a cliche in the writing. We all do it. And the reason that we all do it is because cliches became cliches because they were so great. They were a great description. They were a great turn of phrase. They were a great image. And, you know, one writer used it. And then the next writer was like, wow, that's brilliant. And so they borrowed it. And then it eventually became a cliche that readers look at and they're like, oh yeah, I recognize this. I've seen this a million times before. Now, I've said before that there are some positive things to cliches because they kind of are a shorthand for expressing something, but you do want to be careful about them. So I sometimes tell my writers, okay, let's have you read your text to a critique partner and they're going to tell you if they see any cliches. And if you do, you can just start substituting things out, finding new ways of expressing things. So maybe you can create the new cliche. Another thing that writers worry about with their descriptions is that they really worry that the detail is going to slow down the pacing of their story. And this is a really valid thought. It can. Brandon, for example, definitely slowed down his pacing, definitely didn't have the right balance going on. But then again, neither did Claire, right? So there's a way of balancing description with pacing, and it can be challenging, but we're going to be talking about how you can do that. So don't you worry. Another thing is that some authors are insecure about their vocabulary. Having a limited vocabulary can hinder descriptive writing. Some writers feel really uncertain about their word choices and they struggle. They're going through the thesaurus trying to find this precise and evocative language. But let me tell you, if you're feeling bad about this, first of all, reading is the best way of increasing your vocabulary. But the other thing is you don't need to be coming up with the most scholarly words. Many times writing at a 10th grade level is what is going to help you to reach as many readers as possible. Now, that doesn't mean dumbing it down, but it does mean that you don't need to look for, you know, that word that came from the German that exactly expresses the precise emotion that your character is feeling. Feel free to describe things in a longer way. You don't need to be so incisive. You don't need to have the one word because chances are your reader doesn't know that one word. So it doesn't even help. It's ineffectual. Speaking of ineffectual, uh, the whole show don't tell rule. Sometimes it is misunderstood so that it is ineffectual. It's not applied effectively. So many times writers are stating things and they're missing opportunities for this immersive description that you can get with the show don't tell. But then they also sometimes 
are slowing down the writing again. Again, that pacing where they're showing, not telling absolutely every damn thing. There is a place for telling, not showing, and that balance is key as well. So I think that one of the tips that I would give you when it comes to description is really develop an eye for the pacing in your specific work. Works are not one size fits all. One person may have a ton of description up front and then have some action and then come back to some more description. For you, it may help to weave it in a little bit more. And it's kind of a trial and error type of thing. You definitely want to read and see what your work is really evoking. And one of the most crucial things that your work should be evoking is emotion. Effective description isn't just about calling up a visual image. It's not just about making your reader see what you mean. It's about making your reader feel what you mean. Effective description should evoke emotions in readers. So if you're struggling to connect your description to an emotional state of a character in the scene or to the overall mood of the scene, then your description is not doing its job. Your writing is less compelling. So remember that more than expressing every little visual detail or every sound detail, think about how this creates emotion. So don't over-describe, don't under-describe excessive detail just bogs down your narrative. It distracts and detracts from your story. It can make readers lose interest. Now, of course, whenever I post something about this on TikTok as writing coach, I'll say, okay, you know, you need to streamline your description sometimes and you need to be balanced. And then of course, I'll always have a few commenters who are going to say, oh, I just love stories that are just description and description alone. Great. Okay. Well, you're in the very noisy minority, my friend. And of course, description is beautiful. Of course, description is one of the great pleasures of reading, but there needs to be a story and emotion in there. You don't want to have something that is bloated that you're writing, unless you decide that that's what you want to do. But, you know, what can I say? Editing is your friend when it comes to this. And writers often don't revise and edit their descriptive passages effectively. It's actually really funny. I've seen this happen where my writers are going to be self-editing really well. And then it looks like when they're editing, they're trying to cut down, you know, excess dialogue. They're trying to be really pithy when they're doing certain things. And then all of a sudden, there's a descriptive passage And it looks like they just skipped over it because they're like, great, okay, here's my description of this thing. And um, I'm just going to leave it as is. And they're lengthy. They're convoluted. They don't contribute to the story's impact. Yet it's almost like they skipped it when they were self-editing. And I've seen it happen. I've done this before. I found myself doing it and I was horrified. So I think that just don't worry about the fact that your descriptions might not be exactly the way you want them right now. Between practice refining, studying the works of other authors, getting feedback, and just paying attention and observing the world around you, your descriptive writing is going to get so much better. You can develop this skill with time and dedication and just life experience. So it's, I know it sounds like it's a long road, and that is why I'm going to give you some little hacks for descriptive writing that will probably help to improve your writing just after this episode, I think you're going to see a difference. Um, These are hacks that I always use and I share with my clients and I'm giving them to you right now. So the first one is, I think that if you're writing scene by scene, it's a really good idea to remember to set your scene. And this is a thing where you avoid the white room syndrome, where you make sure that your reader knows the minute they get into the scene, they know what is going on and where. So make sure that for each scene that you're starting, you have touched on where your character is, what it looks like, what it feels like, what it sounds like. Consider using, for example, the rule of three. You know how just a few minutes ago we were talking about why find the one word that's going to describe exactly the precise thing you're trying to describe. It's okay to consider lengthening the description a little bit. And I think that oftentimes when you're describing something, using three sensory details or adjectives can make the description more vivid. For instance, you're going to be describing, I don't know, a forest. And you can say, for example, it's dark, it's lush, it's mysterious, you you know, or intense or some interesting word 
These things can make the description more vivid. And also, if you're pulling adjectives or details from different senses, that also makes your description more vivid. That really helps you with the idea of this synesthesia, right? Go beyond the five senses and describe experiences that mix sensations, right? So if you're talking about music, okay, how long can you describe the sound of the music? What if you were to kind of go so far as to describe a type of texture that the music might have or a type of color that you feel like it had, or, or maybe it even has a taste. And I know that sounds ridiculous when I say it now, but think about it. I would challenge you to come up with some things that you can describe with senses that aren't usually used to describe them. So think in terms of emotions or objects or, you know, sounds, and now try to see if you can kind of fake synesthesia It's kind of amazing when you mix and match these things, it makes the reading so much more interesting and unexpected for your reader. Another great way of bringing inanimate objects to life is by personification. You can attribute human characteristics to them, you know, so you can be talking about an easy chair and you can say that, you know, if the easy chair was an uncle, it would be an uncle dressed in tweed that smells of tobacco and that sits leaning way back with an over, you know, blown belly or something like that. And that can add depth and personality to your description. In previous episodes, I've talked about the idea of a theme in your book. And many times it's really rewarding to the reader if there is a theme or a couple themes in your book. But oftentimes the theme becomes super overwrought and the author has a tendency to hit the reader over the head with the theme. And I've said that the way of expressing a theme without it being too much is by having motifs. And motifs are often these symbolic images or elements that represent the theme or the emotion. So think about how you can use this sensory symbolism and weave it into your descriptions so that they are also enriching and expressing your theme. That's a really great way of doing it. Another little hack that I have for you with the emotions and with the descriptions is being cinematic about it. So if you're watching a movie I really want you to look at how the movie uses the camera to zoom in and out on specific details of a scene. This is really, really important because you want your reader to grasp the overall picture, but you also want them to focus on particular elements. Remember how I said that the only things that you really need to describe are the things that your reader needs to get the picture or to understand what's going on. And movies do this so well. So think about, um, I think it was A Quiet Place, the movie. So you see, you know, the whole house that the people are living in and you have kind of a shot from far away so that you understand how isolated the family is. And, you know, you've got these weird alien creatures And so you're like, wow, how can they get help when they're isolated in this house? And then the camera is going to zoom in and focus on the nail on the staircase. If you've seen this movie, you know what I'm talking about. This creates this suspense, this foreshadowing and everything else just by zooming in and out on specific details of your description. And I think it's such a great way to write a little bit cinematically. I highly, highly recommend if you haven't done this before. So let me just kind of spend a little bit more time on show, don't tell, because this is one of those rules that so many authors have heard a million times. It's a fundamental concept in descriptive writing, and it means that instead of just directly stating facts, emotions, or characteristics, you're presenting them through actions, sensory details, dialogue, things like that. So it's not just the description. Remember that show, don't tell can be in everything, whatever you're using to engage the reader's imagination and emotion, whatever you're using to make the experience of reading more immersive, that's really important. So, you know, telling would just be like, oh, she was sad. Showing is, you know, tears welled in her eyes, her throat felt constricted, her shoulders slumped as she looked at the old box full of photographs, the memories of the happier days, you know, kind of tasting like, you know, I don't know, tasting like a stale cake, 
stuck in her throat, you know, something like that. This hideous. So you see how I'm going to have to rewrite this passage, but I'm getting these details. I'm getting the synesthesia going in. I've got all of these different details of showing how the character feels. It's more vivid and engaging, but you don't need to do this all the time because if you did, it would ruin your pacing. So it's safe enough to just, just gloss over or quickly describe something or quickly summarize something because you don't want your story to get bogged down. A story, even if it's got a slow pace, needs to keep moving inexorably forward. So how can you do this? How can you balance description and pacing? The first thing I said is you have to very quickly do some scene setting at the beginning of every scene. That's really important. And I think that pacing wise, this helps the reader not to have to go back or stop and wonder, wait, where is this happening? What is going on? What does this look like? What should I be imagining? Only to then have their idea be contradicted later in the scene. That's really disturbing. And it kind of knocks you out of that suspension of disbelief. And, you know, that that thing where you're completely immersed. So, Integrate your descriptions also into actions. Describe things as they become relevant to the story or when they can enhance the mood rather than in these long, uninterrupted passages like Brandon used to do. This is something that really keeps the story moving and is really, really helpful. Remember that when you're describing things also, think about whose point of view is it? Whose perspective is it? So Brandon, poor Brandon, he's going to listen to this episode and be like, wow, thanks writing coach. But he's improved so much that I think he'll be okay with it. Um, Brandon would describe things beautifully from the author's point of view. And I honestly think that if you're describing things from your character's point of view, from your character's perspective, you're getting a lot more depth to the description. You're getting to understand the character that much more. And you're keeping pace with the story because the character is experiencing this at the same time as the reader is. So I think that's really, really a great little hack to use is using a character's perspective for any description that you do. And also this can, this will impact the mood, the tone, the feel it can be really, really useful. You're going to want to vary the length of your descriptions. Not all descriptions need to be lengthy. You can have shorter, impactful ones when the pacing needs to be faster, and you can save longer descriptions for moments when the story can afford the slower pace. That's really important. You also don't really need to give a blow-by-blow description every time, right? Provide little chunks of detail when needed. So, you know, for example, you can be in a room, right? You describe the atmosphere, then you can focus on a particular object that's crucial in the scene. And you've basically given us enough for now. And then you can return later to this room and provide some new chunks of detail. So that's kind of interesting as well. I like to sometimes show these details that might have been missed. This is a great way of building up suspense as well. It's kind of interesting. And also remember, you don't need to describe every single thing. When somebody is experiencing something, even if they're walking into a room, do you think they take in the whole entire room and every single detail all at once, especially if something important is about to happen in that room? No, they're focusing on what matters. And sometimes it's okay to imply things, provide a few key details, and readers can use their imagination to create a fuller picture. That's part of that magical alchemy that happens between the author and the reader. Trust your reader to fill in those gaps as long as you've done your job properly. And that requires practice and experimentation. Don't worry. Keep learning, keep growing, and you are going to get better and better at conveying things the way you want to as you weave these descriptions into your writing. So I hope this helped with the whole idea of description. And by the way, if you're at all curious, In my master class from Idea to Published in six months, believe you me, I've got lots of resources for how to do this description stuff, how to do the show don't tell. I've got some workbook exercises where you can really figure out how to describe the world of your story without weighing your story down. And also in DIY Author, you'll find some worksheets that have that same sort of stuff. It's not going to be quite as in-depth, but you're a DIY kind of person. So head over to onlinecoursesforwriters.com and you'll find all of that right there. Now, let's talk about the synopsis. And I actually feel disingenuous saying the synopsis because actually authors may need to craft different types of synopses in their career. 
even for a single novel, you might be crafting different types of synopsis depending on the context and the purpose. So let's talk about several of the types of synopsis that authors might find themselves working on. I don't want to discourage you right away, but um, just be thinking that this is something that's going to be required of you. So one of the things that you might need, so when you query, there are a couple different types of synopsis that they might ask you for. So in your query letter, you might want to do kind of an elevator pitch um, when you are pitching your book in the letter, like it's not a traditional synopsis, but it's a great little blurb or it's an attention grabbing description of your novel designed to pique the interest of a potential reader or of an agent. So that's really important. The book blurb or elevator pitch is a whole synopsis that you're going to want to craft because it's not just for querying. It's also something you can use on book covers, in your marketing materials, and, you know, in your Amazon profile, all of that stuff. So that's one type of synopsis. Um, Also in a query, you might have a one to two page synopsis. Many times um, agents will ask for this. They'll say a brief synopsis, and that brief means one or two pages. And it's an overview of the novel's key elements. It's going to include main characters, central conflict, plot points, but it can't go into so much detail. You're not going to go really plot point by plot point necessarily because you just don't have space to do it. But some literary agents or publishers may also request a more detailed synopsis. And this one's probably going to be around three to five pages. This is a more comprehensive summary of the story. It's got character arcs. It might even have subplots. And it might be talking a little bit about theme. And then you're, you've got the evil people who ask you for a chapter-by-chapter chapter synopsis. And actually, this is kind of a little bit easier, I think, because for me, my outlines are pretty much a chapter by chapter synopsis because I will create my outline by scene by scene. I'll be saying what's going on in the scene, where it's happening, why it's important in a couple sentences. And that's my outline. And so I think that here's my quick synopsis hack is that I really think that creating an outline after your story is done, that is really something that helps you to create both the longer form synopses, the chapter by chapter synopsis, and the elevator pitch. So that's super interesting. Um, I also think that here's one thing is that you really need to think about, and also OPS, if somebody's asking you for a log line, um, that's going to be an ultra brief synopsis of the novel, not even a full synopsis. It's like an elevator pitch as well, but it's kind of the same thing. So um, that is pretty useful, but you have to look when you are querying or you're submitting your book or you're marketing or whatever you're doing, you know, sometimes you've got a specific audience. Sometimes you're doing a synopsis for book bloggers or uh, potential advertisers or endorsers or readers. You really need to think about who your audience is for the synopsis because it is going to change how your synopsis looks, right? Depending on the context. Always pay strict attention to submission guidelines because if you don't pay attention to them, that really lessens your chances to gain representation. So think of the intended purpose of your synopsis, right? You should be prepared to create different types to meet the various needs of your writing and publishing journey. And I get it. Writing a synopsis can be so challenging. My authors are always struggling with this, and so am I, let me tell you. Um, There's so many reasons why it's hard to write a synopsis. It sometimes takes me longer to write a synopsis than it does to even write a few chapters, frankly, because you're distilling a complex and often lengthy narrative into this brief summary. This can be really hard. What do you include? What do you leave out? It feels like an oversimplification of your work, and I'm with you. It totally is but it's, you know, a necessary evil. So what are you going to do? Um, Also, this clarity and conciseness, like so many writers love to have 100,000 words to play with as they're trying to talk about the plot points, the character arcs, the themes, and they are allowed detail. But all of a sudden, when you have to be clear and concise, this can be a huge challenge. You've been working on this book for a long time. You know all the cool stuff about it. How are you going to do that without feeling like you're reducing the emotion and the nuance? And here's the thing. 
in a synopsis, you typically do have to prioritize the plot and developments and like the major con- conflict, I would say. And I know that it feels like you're losing the essence of your story. Absolutely. But unfortunately, again, that's the way it is. Now, many writers worry about a spoiler. When they're writing a synopsis, they're worried about giving away too much. They don't want to miss on, you know, the intrigue and they don't want to give away the ending, which would spoil everything for a reader or a publisher. Here's the thing, though. These two synopses are different types of synopses. If you're writing a synopsis for a potential reader, you're definitely not giving away too much. You're just saying what's intriguing, right? And I'm going to give you more hints, tips, and hacks on how to write a good synopsis. But for now, suffice it to say that the synopsis that you write for an agent or a publisher is very different than the synopsis you write for a reader. Because for an agent or publisher, you are going to need to tell them the ending. I know, it's true, but you're going to have to do that. And I get that it's really hard to write a synopsis for many writers because you're transitioning from creativity to business. Writing a synopsis is often part of the submission process or it's part of the marketing process. And I know that this transition from creative storytelling to more business-oriented writing can be really jarring for a lot of writers. But one of my major platforms as a writing coach, one of my major messages that I have is that if you want to be a successful author, you have to be a solopreneur. You have to be somebody who can wear those hats and you don't have to be the best business person on earth, but there's some things that I think you can do better than anybody else. And of course, there are ways of doing less of the business and more of the creative, but there are trade-offs every time. So I think it's really important to be willing to at least do this part of it because no one's going to do a synopsis for your book as well as you can. Now, summarizing, you know, so many things, it feels really hard. It doesn't feel very free. I get it. It feels restrictive. You've got guidelines, you've got word limits, and you're used to the creative freedom of storytelling. And here's the thing again, right? I was talking about when you have a submission guideline, if they ask for your synopsis to be a certain length, yeah, I know you're a creative person, but you're gonna need to do that. So I know the reduced freedom doesn't feel great, but think of the freedom that you'll have once you're a successful author. I think that that can be a really motivating factor. And half the time also when you're writing a synopsis, since it is part of the query process or the marketing process, you get this huge fear of rejection. Like what if my synopsis doesn't capture the essence of my work enough? What if I get rejected? What if my book doesn't get bought? What am I going to do? I get it. I know. It doesn't help to be writing with a fire under your butt. And that's exactly what it can feel like. So how do we overcome all of these challenges and write a really fabulous synopsis? you know what I'm going to say. Practice makes perfect. Practice writing synopses. Write multiple versions. This is going to make you more comfortable with the process. And let me divulge something is that I often will go back and rework synopses for my existing books. Even I'll go onto Amazon and I'll change out the description because we're always learning and growing. And it's definitely useful to make sure that we have this practice and that we keep doing it because your first synopsis that you write is not going to be the end-all be-all. Having feedback, showing your synopsis to other people, it can definitely help you to improve. And you can also find really well-written synopses online. So study those, see what people have done. Yours doesn't have to be identical to theirs, of course, but definitely think about, okay, what are the core elements of a story and of a good synopsis? You've got to talk about the main character, the central conflict, key plot points, and if appropriate, resolution. So remember the purpose of your synopsis. It is to generate interest in your book. So remember, it's a teaser, not a substitute for the entire book, of course. But let's talk about these hacks that you can really use. So first of all, consider the story spine. I use this a lot for writing my synopsis. So I mentioned how using your detailed outline is a great first place to start. Know this outline inside and out, and then think about putting that into the story spine because that very many times can help you to get a really basic blurb or synopsis done already. Also think about, okay, what's the voice 
and style of my synopsis? Do I want to use a character's perspective? That could be kind of interesting. The perspective of your main character. This gives a unique and engaging dimension to the synopsis. It can make it more emotionally resonant. Also, when you're writing a synopsis, usually use your active voice, right? And strong verbs. You want the synopsis, no matter how your book is, your book's possibly in the past tense or whatever, but your synopsis is going to be present tense. Sarah doesn't like to swim. However, when a wave comes over her village, you know, whatever, this is the way that you make a synopsis more dynamic. It also conveys a sense of action and urgency, and it just generally helps, and it's what's expected. So do that. When you're writing a synopsis, yes, you're focusing on the plot, but it is crucial to convey the emotional stakes for the characters. So think about the desires, conflicts, and personal growth. Definitely highlight that because agents and readers are looking for the emotional payoff of your book. Now, definitely, I would say try to open with a hook. You want to grab the reader's attention. So start with something compelling and intriguing. Even if you're writing a long-form synopsis that's a little bit more chronological, definitely open with something that is going to be interesting, something, some challenge your character faces, some question that they want answered, you know, something like that that's going to be compelling and intriguing or imagine something, whatever it is that entices the reader. I would say challenge yourself to write about 10 or 20 hooks for this single synopsis, and then you can choose the best one. If your story has like themes and symbolism, you might choose to subtly weave them into the synopsis. This will add a little bit of depth and it can signal to your reader, your agent, your publisher that your work has maybe this literary merit on top of just the fun plot. Also, speaking of themes and symbolism, think about whether you want to present your synopsis in chronological order or do you want it to be more like in thematic order or focusing on different character developments? This choice can really impact what your synopsis looks like. So really do that wisely. Oftentimes I would just say it's safer to go chronological, but just know that it's not your only choice. Um, and people have asked me, should I use dialogue in my synopsis? Many times they really like the exchange that two characters will have. They feel like it conveys character voices. It might be able to express a key plot point, a turning point. Yes, but I kind of feel like it's a little bit, I don't know, it's unexpected, which might be a good thing, but I feel like if it's not used sparingly, um, it can definitely make the pacing of the synopsis feel off. That's something that I want you to think about and consider. If you're going to use dialogue in your synopsis, I would usually say that unless you are gung-ho about doing it, maybe hold off. Also, backstory. Backstory, you might have some backstory in your book. You're going to need to imply it here. You want to maintain the intrigue, but you want to keep the focus on the main narrative in your synopsis. You do not have place to write implied any of the backstory, so just imply it. And you could end, if it's not for the agents, definitely end with a cliffhanger that makes the reader want to know more. It could even be a question, right? Like, what will Susie do now that she, you know, has built a boat? I mean, something like that. And that'll really convey the essence of your story and get the reader really curious and interested to read the actual work after having looked at this little synopsis. But remember, again, more important than the things that I've said about the synopsis is what the person who needs your synopsis is expecting. So remember, submission guidelines and any other requirements, that's going to be first and foremost. You don't want to deviate from those. Because again, this is business, much more than creativity. You can have some creativity come into it, but you are in the business of selling your book and getting it read. So that's it. If you want more wonderful synopsis writing exercises, I have a whole section on this in my course from Idea to Publish in Six Months and also in DIY Author. One of those is probably right for you, and you can definitely head over to creativeandwritingcoach.com, and you will see how these two programs differ. And uh, I think 
this can really help anyone, whether you're a strict beginner or you've decided to finally become serious about your writing career and you've been doing this for a while, but you feel like you need a kick in the pants or you need some kind of a catalyst to take you to the next level. I think that either one of those programs is going to be really, really helpful to you. Thank you so much for being here with me on the How to Be an Author podcast. I look forward to being with you next time. And in the meantime, happy writing. If you have any pressing writing-related questions or would like to be featured on the How to Be an Author podcast, please feel free to reach out on my website, creativeandwritingcoach.com.